Good morning. My name is Jennifer. I'm one of the pastors here, and it's actually my joy to be with you in this in-between week, between Christmas and New Year's, between the hustle and bustle of the holidays and the startup of what is new, between 2020 and 2021. So this weekend, welcome to this service. Glad that you're with us this morning. Hey, I don't know if your house looks anything like mine, but at my house, the presents are open, the stockings are empty, and it may or may not look like a tornado swept through my living room. Some hopes were realized with sparkling eyes and perhaps smiles of glee, and some hopes were disappointed, like the Lego Christmas Elf Clubhouse. Did any of you know it was a thing that Lego Christmas sets just like get bought out the day that they're released and then they show up on eBay weeks later for like double the price that Lego was selling them? Yeah, that was a disappointment in our house this year. I'm guessing that some things were expected, gifts that were bought off the list, traditional meals, and some things were unexpected, like my friend's dog who ran into my living room and peed on my Christmas tree. For some of you though, The disappointments of Christmas might have been deeper than a Lego you couldn't get for your child or a tree skirt that needed to go in the laundry. For some of you, 2020 delivered just one late last blow in the loss of some of your beloved Christmas traditions, places you would have been, people you would have been with. I know for me, I love our time with Jeff's extended family. Between he and his siblings and their kids and the grandkids and the great grandkids, there's now about 40 of us, give or take a baby or two. I've honestly lost count. And I love our time together and the Roth Martin Christmas didn't happen this year. Our annual tradition, our rendition of the nativity story, complete with adorable three and four year old wise men and a glowing angel with blonde, beautiful hair and Mary and Joseph and donkeys and camels and sheeps of various sizes with various costumes. Mushu might be in there somewhere some years. Not to mention the shepherds, ranging in age from 1 to 25. It's my favorite family event, and we didn't get to do it this year. As a matter of fact, the costumes are still in their tubs in my bonus room, waiting for 2021. And isn't that kind of the posture of a lot of us these days? We're waiting for 2021. With bated breath, we're wondering, what will the new year hold? And really, 2021 is a year of hope, and uncertainty. Some of us have more hope than we've had in a long time because really, let's be, let's be honest, can anything be worse than 2020? I mean, anything's got to be better, right? Our hopes are growing and yet there's also the uncertainties. Will the changes come in time to salvage some of the things that are dear to us? Will the changes come in time for your business or your job? Will they come in time for your marriage or your children? Will they come in time for your mental health or the mental health of someone that you love? Friends, this has been a year of challenge and loss and grief and hardship. And as we stand on the cusp of 2021, we acknowledge that that is with hope and it is with uncertainty. There are so many questions. I wonder if I were to start to list our concerns. How will the virus, how will this... um, you know, you call it a vaccine. How will this vaccine change our current realities? Is there any chance of sports or concerts of in-person learning for students before the end of this school year? When will we be back in this place worshiping together without any limitations? There are so many questions. You could fill in the blank. What will happen about? And what is your concern? Is it the upcoming change in our president? Is it something else in our culture or society? Is it a broken relationship or your housing, your finances, your own health, your children and how they're doing? Friends, I don't know your concerns right now, but I'm pretty sure that most of us face what is coming next with hope and quite a bit of uncertainty. We've been in a series called Emmanuel, God with us. And as we look now to turn the corner to 2021, I want to ask the question today, what does it matter that God is with us going into 2021? What does it mean that God is with us? Literally, the with us God. You know, for Christmas, we we pull out our decorations. Emmanuel, God with us. My little baby in the manger. 
you know, is a manual just for the Christmas season? Does the baby in the manger go back in, in the box with the decorations and go to storage until next December? Or does this child that was born to us make a difference in our day-to-day -day world? If you had come to the Advent prayer path, many of you did, you would have seen this image. It was in a crude stable, and it's Mary and baby Jesus. And the question I have for us today is, does it matter that this baby came, that this Christ child came to earth? How does the baby that we've been celebrating make a difference and change our day-to-day -day world, even as we look at the turn of the new year? How does God with us make a difference? What does Jesus say about his presence here on earth, about the promised Holy Spirit, and about our lives in light of his life? What does it matter that God came? As I've been thinking about this, about Emmanuel, the with us God, in light of this in-between week where we're turning the corner from 2020 to 2021, I've been drawn to the scriptures and to the promises of God See, God's word is full of his promises of who he is, who he is in us and through us and in our world, what it means that we live with a God who is with us. And so this morning, I want us to look at some of those promises of God. In Matthew chapter 28, as Jesus is giving some of his final teaching to his disciples, he says these words. He says, and be sure of this. And I love this phrase because he's saying, pay attention, take note, this is important. Be sure of this. The thing that I'm about to say is something you want to remember. Be sure of this. I am with you always. And when Jesus uses words like always, do you know what he means? What he actually means is always. He doesn't mean sometimes. He doesn't mean most of the time. He doesn't mean almost always except when he forgets. He means always. And he says, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And friends, we haven't reached the end of the age yet. That means that Jesus is with us. Now be sure of this. Jesus is with us always, even to the end of the age. That means even if I can't see him, he is with me. Even if I can't feel him, he's with me. If I don't know he's with me, he's with me. Friends, even if I don't believe he's with me, he is with me because that is one of his promises. But here's the thing I wonder. What I wonder is how. How can Jesus be with us when we are stuck in our human form on this beautiful, broken planet when he is God in heaven? We know that Jesus died and he rose again and he ascended into heaven to be with the Father. So how can he be with us? And the how is explained in John chapters 14 and 15 and 16 as over and over and over again, Jesus says to his disciples, when I return to my father, I will not leave you alone. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will ask my father and he will send the Holy Spirit. Friends, just as Jesus is the person of God who was revealed as our with us God in the incarnation, Holy Spirit is the person of God revealed at Pentecost as the with us God who is with you and I day to day to day in every moment in 2020 and 2021 and beyond. So Holy Spirit is this with us God moving forward with us in our lives in this day and in this time. And we ask the question, what are the promises of God with this with us God for our day and our current realities? In John, this with us, God promises that Holy Spirit will be an advocate. He will be our defender and our helper, our strengthener and our comforter. And I would ask you, do you need an advocate like this in your life? God has got your back. In Matthew, this with us, God promises us his rest. Are you weary? Are you worn out? God will restore your soul and he will teach you the restful pace of his grace. In Philippians, this with us God promises his peace that passes understanding. Do you wrestle with anxiety? God will give you his peace and you don't even have to be able to wrap your brain around what's going on. It passes our understanding and yet it is his peace. In John, he promises, this with us God promises that our lives with him will bear much fruit. Have you been feeling discouraged, wondering if your life is making a difference? 
God gives your life meaning and purpose. He puts you in places with people where he is using the you that he created you to be, where you will bear fruit, not just for today, but for eternity. In James, this with us God promises us his wisdom. Friends, have you been in confusion? Are there challenging situations where you don't know the way through and you need wisdom? God will give you the wisdom you need for today. In 2 Timothy, this with us God, he promises that he will give us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Do you struggle with fear? Are you afraid? God is willing to give you his power and his love and his sound mind. And in the Psalms, this with us God promises that he is the one who will teach us and instruct us and show us the way we need to go. Do you have questions about your future? Have you been looking for direction? This God will be your counselor and he will watch over you. He will show you the way to go. And we're just scratching the surface. There are so many promises of God in scripture. Romans 8 alone has so many promises. (laughs) Get me started on Romans 8. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He is not standing in condemnation over us. You and I are not controlled by our sinful nature anymore, but we're controlled by the Spirit. And this same Spirit is helping us in our weakness. He's not judging us in our weakness. He's interceding for us. He's actually praying for what he knows we need. And God, God is working all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do you catch that promise? God is working all things. That means all circumstances to the good. That means even things that the enemy intends for evil, God is working for good. This is our with us God. Listen to this as I keep reading in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 31. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? Friends, have you been facing accusation? Maybe on social media, somebody misunderstood you and you took a hit. Maybe in your work world, there's been a false accusation leveled against you and you're fighting for your reputation. Maybe there's something you did and there is accusation coming against you and you need to confess and make it right. But here's what I want to say. One of the promises of God is that because God is for you and because God forgives you, in 1 John 9, this with us God promises his forgiveness. Have you messed up? Just tell him, and he's ready to make you clean just as if you'd never sinned. Has the accuser been bringing your sin and your mess-ups against you? Right here in Romans chapter 8, it says, no, no one can accuse us because God is for us. No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Did you catch that? Both Holy Spirit and Jesus are interceding for us. They're praying for us. They know us and they're on our side. They are for us. They've got our back. Friends, the promises of God are so rich and so deep and so full. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death, or pandemic, or breathing the smoke of the fires. Friends, have there been time this last year that you've wondered if God loves you because of the challenges and the suffering in your life? Because of the challenges and the suffering in our community and in our world? No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Did you hear it? There's this climax. There's promise after promise after promise, and it comes to this climax of, I am convinced. And what is he convinced of? He's convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. This is the great promise in God that we are loved. And I would stop and I would ask again, why does that matter? What does love have to do with what you and I need today and tomorrow and the next day? Sure, it's nice to be loved, but what are the practicalities? And this is the practicality. Because our with us God, he says, God is love and there is no fear in love. And friends, there's something that we need a lot less of in this world right now and it's fear. We've had enough fear. 
And when you and I can rest in the promise of God's love, we can begin to walk without fear. I don't claim to understand all the mysteries of God. His is a peace that passes understanding. It is a love that surpasses knowledge. It is a grace that is too wonderful for me, and it is a power beyond all that I could ever ask or imagine. No, I don't understand all the mysteries of God, but this I know. Our with us God is enough. He is enough for me and my inner struggles and the sin that I can see and the challenges I have in my life. And he is enough for you, those things that concern you. When you say, I am worried about blank, he is enough for whatever is in that blank. The with us God that we serve is enough for whatever happened in our past to wound us or betray things that we've been resentful and unforgiving about. He is enough to walk with us in that. Our with us God is enough for the challenges we face today. And our with us God is enough for the unknown and the uncertainties that are coming in the future. Our with us God is enough. So what do we do in response to this with us God? How do we respond to this with us God? One way you might respond, friends, we have only scratched the surface of his promises as found in scripture. Maybe you dive into his word with your own research and find more promises. Maybe you talk about that with a friend, with a family member, with your house church. What are some of the promises that you found in scripture? What are some of the promises that rise to the surface as the ones that you need to anchor to in these days and times because of the challenges that you are facing? Whatever it is, lean in to these promises of God. We also respond to the promises of God with gratitude. Over and over again in scripture, God calls us to give thanks. And again, I wonder why. Is it because he likes the accolades? And I don't think so. I think it's because God knows that our hearts are changed when we practice giving thanks. When we actually live our lives looking for the thing that we can be grateful for. In his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul actually said, give thanks in all circumstances, in all circumstances. And I just have to confess, there's a lot that has happened in the last 12 months where thankfulness was not the first thing that rose out of me. And yet, if we believe the promise of God that he is with us always, then he was with us in all of those circumstances. And if we believe the promise of God that he is working for the good of those who love him, even taking what the enemy intends for evil and turning it to good, then we know that he is working for the good in those circumstances, even when the circumstances themselves are not good at all. And so friends, if we can learn to look with different eyes, eyes that expect to find something to be grateful for, I believe it will change our heart and it will change the way we see the world. It will change the way we experience our world around us and others around us. And we will become a person who lives more into the promises of God because we're looking for the promises of God at work. How would an attitude of gratefulness change your outlook headed into 2021? Maybe this would be a great time to start that gratitude journal you've thought about. You know, just a book to set on your nightstand and jot down a couple things at the end of the day that you've been grateful for. Because I believe if we make a practice of looking for what to be thankful for, we will be making a practice of changing our perception of the world. So we respond to God's promises with gratitude. We also respond to God's promises with trust. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. And I think that's, that's the key of our problem with trust, friends. When the world around us is all that we can see, when all that I can know is what I already know, all that I can think are the thoughts that go through my head, I don't understand it all. And when the chaos in my world becomes overwhelming and more that I can understand, I have a tendency to respond not in trust, but with anxiety and worry, anger and accusation, perhaps cynicism, skepticism. And it's difficult to trust God if I'm leaning on my understanding. Where have you been leaning on your own understanding? And might there be a practice 
of knowing that God knows so much more and he sees so much more. He, he knew before time and he knows the end of time and his understanding is mysterious and bigger than ours. And what happens if we trust in him with all of our heart? Not because of the outcomes, but because of who he is. Not because of the way our circumstances look, but because we know him. We trust in the God we know, even in the midst of what doesn't make sense to us. What would it look like to practice trust? I wonder if one way might be to turn these promises into a breath prayer. So whether there's some of the promises I've listed or some of the promises you found as you've looked in scripture, to take that promise like, God, you promised to forgive me when I confess my sin and I've really messed up, so would you please forgive me? It's a promise turned into a breath prayer that leads to trust. It moves you out of that place of beating yourself up for your sin and into that place of receiving God's grace and forgiveness for your sin. Or what about a sound mind? God, you promised that you give me a spirit of a sound mind and I have been so confused lately. Would you give me your sound mind? And I walk forward trusting that you can give me the wisdom that I need, the discernment that I need for the things that are on my plate today. We turn our promises of God into breath prayers and we practice trust. So we respond with gratitude, we respond with trust, and we respond with confidence. Confidence, as I'm talking about it, is the ability to engage with the world in the strength that God has given us with courage. Here's the deal. Over the last 12 months, we've all done our days. We get out of bed, most of us put our pants on one leg at a time, and we do the things that are ours to do. But many of us have done those days just waiting for the next day to come. We've done those days discouraged. We've done those days in grief. Perhaps there have been some good ones. Perhaps there have been some bad ones. But friends, when we anchor to the promises of God, we can do those days with confidence because we know that whatever the day holds, God is with us, he's in us, and he's giving us what we need for the day that we have. It's found in the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Give us today our daily bread. We can walk with the confidence of knowing that he is giving us what he needs for what he created us to do. I love how the prophet Jeremiah said it. In Jeremiah chapter 17, he talked about the confident person this way. He said, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Friends, what would it be like for our hope and confidence not to be blown and tossed by all the waves of uncertainty, but to be rooted into the confidence in God, to go so deep that we're not bothered by drought or storm or pandemic because our confidence is in God. So we respond to the promises of God with gratitude, with trust, with confidence, and with worship. When we truly see this with us God, this powerful, loving, mysterious, promise-keeping God, what rises up in us? It is worship. It is praise, it is adoration. As we're worshiping together this morning, I wanna share a story with you of an experience I had in prayer recently. Over the last few months, I've been praying in a way that's new to me. I've been introduced to some prayer exercises that are just different ways of talking to God. And one of those was an invitation to consider sin, specifically to consider the sin in the garden. To pray as I read through the chapter of Genesis chapter three and put myself in the story and imagine what would I feel like? What would I see? What would I hear? What would it be like to be in the garden while Adam and Eve were making that choice about that sin in the garden? And so I opened up my Bible and I began to read the story there in Genesis. And as I began to imagine the garden, I, I sensed in this place what, what came over me was just the utter perfection the clarity of color, the vibrancy of the light, the purity of the air. It was just an astounding peace and joy. 
I could see Adam and Eve at the tree and I could sense the approach of the serpent and I knew what was coming and it grieved me, but I could do nothing but watch as they had this conversation with the serpent and they were deceived and they chose not only to disobey God, but to distrust God, to not believe his heart for them, that he was good. And in that moment, as each of them in turn took a bite of that fruit, the forbidden fruit, there was a slit cut in the air of the garden. There was a rent in the atmosphere and through that slit poured this dark black fog. It came through and sunk and spread over the ground. With the fog came a dragon-like beast who quickly disappeared, but what kept coming through this slit in the atmosphere was this mist, this fog. And as it swirled and spread around the garden, it muted that clarity of color and it dimmed that sense of joy and peace and it penetrated Adam and Eve and it penetrated me with its darkness and its heaviness and its weightiness. And I watched as it spread from us into the world that everywhere we stepped, there was this multiplication of the darkness and the mist, this fog. It was, I grieved, I wept. It was a visceral experience as I realized that this, this mist was roiling up in me and it was penetrating others as a result of my sin, that I was bearing this weightiness, but I was also harming others. I was a part of humanity as we multiplied this across the face of the earth. In some ways, it was like Pigpen in Charlie Brown, the, the kid who always has the dust just kind of swirling around him everywhere he goes. We were that way. Everywhere we went, we carried this essence of this dark mist and fog. The thing that my deep grief was stirred up from was that there was no remedy. From the instant that that slit was torn in the sky and that mist began to come through, there was no putting it back. There was no taping up the slit. There was no way to get the world back to its perfection. That joy and that peace, that clarity, that vibrancy, it was lost forever. There was no remedy over and over and over again. I realized I am perpetuating something I don't want to perpetuate. It is insidious. It is surrounding us. It has infected us and there is no remedy. And I wept and I wept and I wept as I prayed to God, aware for the first time perhaps of what the weight of sin in our world is. And as I was Finishing up that time of prayer, th this exercise that I was reading that was leading me through this time of prayer invited me to talk with Jesus about what I had just experienced in the garden. Specifically to talk with the crucified Christ on the cross, to look at him there on the cross and to just talk with him about what I had felt and what I had seen. And friends, it was such a powerful experience. And yet as I looked up at Jesus on that cross, the picture changed. Because friend, that mist was being sucked into our Lord. He, he was a fog vacuum. That darkness was coming to Jesus and it was just disappearing into him and he was sucking up. And as that darkness continued to be drawn into Jesus, there was this growing space around him. And it was a space of clarity of color and of vibrancy of the light, of purity of the air astounding in its peace and its joy. He was restoring the perfection of the garden and friends. It hit me in a flash. Oh, he's the remedy. There is no remedy, but he is the remedy. And then I thought, oh my goodness, I've known this my whole life, but I've never known it before today. That he is the remedy and my deep grief and the weightiness and my sorrow of this darkness that had no remedy turned to joy as I realized that this is what it means when the Bible says that he took his sins upon himself. He took our sins upon himself, the sins of the whole world and that deep dark mist fog that swirled and was insidious was being sucked into Jesus, our living God, because he took the sins of the world on himself. This is our with us God. This is our hope. Friends, we do not live in unredeemed, in unremedied darkness. The light has come and he is our remedy. He is the remedy for all of our brokenness, our anger and the violence and the injustice and the disrespect, the, the insecurity, the betrayal. Friends, the anger and the fear and the anxiety. He is our remedy. Name your pain. He took it upon himself on the cross. This is our with us God. He is enough and he is the one we remember and we worship now. <laughs>